If you were to ask the average person to name any composer, chances are you could narrow down the answers to just a handful of names they might say. Without specifying a category, most would say Beethoven, Mozart, or Bach, and if you asked for a film or TV composer, most would say Hans Zimmer or John Williams. You might get some variation for games, since even casual gamers actually tend to care about the music a lot more than a casual moviegoer does for the film soundtrack, but you'd probably still get quite a few saying Uematsu Nobuo if they're more into Japanese. Japanese games, or maybe Grant Kirkhope or Austin Wintory for the Western ones. Anime isn't really an exception to this kind of generalization, as anyone who actually can name a composer probably knows the big ones I've mentioned in previous videos already. Kajiro Yuki, Sawano Hiroyuki, Kan no Yoko, and Kevin Pankin. Given that anime is still somewhat niche though, fans might give a bit of variation with names like Maida Jun, Kawai Kenji, and Hayashi Yuki every now and then. But even when they do, it's pretty rare for someone to mention one of of these composers before the others I listed off before. And the saddest part is that some of the absolute best Japanese composers aren't recognized even when people can recognize their work. As an example, what does the name Yamada Yutaka make you think of? If you saw the thumbnail, then you probably already have an idea, but out of context, this name won't mean anything to most people. Well, what if I told you I can change that with two simple words? Would you believe me? Let's try giving it a shot. Glassy Sky. Glassy Sky! If you've seen Tokyo Ghoul, you know this song, and even if you haven't seen Tokyo Ghoul, you might know the song anyway. To this day, I'm still baffled by the fact that Tokyo Ghoul's soundtrack is so well known, yet Yamada is someone I've never heard anyone talk about. Ever. I mean, I'm sure people have talked about him before, especially given three of the relatively big shows he's written music for, but aside from seeing the odd comment praising the music from X show he's been a part of, no one ever mentions his name, and so he's been lost in the mix of underappreciated composers. So let's try and change that. <laughs> Now, I won't lie, it's been such a long time since I watched Tokyo Ghoul that all I remember is really liking the first season before Route A happened. But regardless of what I think of the show as a whole, I still listen to its soundtrack to this day because of how amazing it is in just about every aspect. It's quite rare for anime soundtracks to have recordings with full live orchestras because as you can imagine, doing so is incredibly expensive, even for just a single track. And while the idea of getting an orchestra to record quite a bit of an entire soundtrack soundtrack might not be exceedingly impressive, take into account that this was Yamada's first solo composition project, his first time as the lead composer, and the fact that he wrote all of this before he was even 25 years old. Whether you actually care about his music or not, hearing a piece like this and finding out it was written by a newcomer to the industry is insanely impressive. What we have here isn't just a standard orchestral anime soundtrack piece either, but an actual symphonic suite akin to what you might hear in a Hollywood blockbuster. The piece opens with some distant choral singing accompanied by light string textures and a sparse piano line. This creates an empty dystopian atmosphere, like the world we've encountered has long since perished along with its inhabitants. Not long after, the music is suddenly twisted into a dark, muddy sound, led in by a super ball being dragged across a bass drum. The strings suddenly grow frantic, and the piano melody morphs into atonal textures as the whole ensemble crescendos into an overwhelmingly dissonant echo chamber. As this settles on an unsettling choral chord, the piano comes back in with a tonal melody, creating a sense of calm in the wake of the chaos from a moment ago. And then we get blasted with the first real sense of movement, a pounding string rhythm to set the world in motion, layered with drums and a piano pulse for musical continuity as the choir and horns build in. The Hollywood influence is strong, and it's unlike anything you would normally hear in even a Japanese film, let alone a regular TV anime series. This becomes even more apparent by the Danny Elfman-inspired section played by the woodwinds, piano, and percussion.
With so many Western influences, it's no surprise that Yamada has a second home in LA and has worked on quite a number of non-Japanese film works. Again, I haven't watched Tokyo Ghoul in a very long time, so I can't go too in-depth in regards to interpreting the music. But I do know that, given the title of this track, which means butterfly in German, this one has strong ties to both Hinami for obvious visual reasons and Kaneki on a more metaphorical level. One of the things I love about Tokyo Ghoul's soundtrack is its relative lack of subtlety, which is extremely odd to say given how usually a lack of subtlety would also equate to a lack of depth or finesse on the composer's end. There are a lot of metaphors and symbols scattered throughout Tokyo Ghoul, both in the anime and manga, and while Yamada could have doubled down on this by making the music more abstract and thought-provoking, he instead opted for pieces that represent exactly what one would expect, allowing the viewer to focus on these elements without additional complexity. The symphonic piece we heard before served as a thematic overture to encapsulate the horror and intensity of the story, while a piece like this represents the evolution of a character over time, the butterfly serving as a symbol of the character and their growth. The track opens with the harp laying out a C-sharp Dorian scale while a glockenspiel and shimmery string texture fill out the higher registers. Without any low instruments or quick rhythms, the piece feels very delicate and easy to associate with a butterfly, or in a more interpretive look, a caterpillar that will become a butterfly. On the side of Tokyo Ghoul's characters, Hinami and Kaneki are both merely victims of circumstance. The former a young girl whose parents were killed by the investigators, and the latter just a normal, shy human student who became a ghoul without his knowledge or consent. As the flute comes in with its hopeful yet melancholic melody, we can feel the sense of growth in both characters, adapting to the changes in their lives as they come to terms with the loss and suffering of the lives they once knew. A string section comes in soon after, filling out the lower textures to open up the soundscape as well as the world that Hinami and Kaneki find themselves a part of. This lasts only a short while, however, as the ensemble reduces down to a flute solo with only some simple harp chords for the middle section of the piece. This can be viewed as the chrysalis stage, where both characters, having experienced this new way of life, can reflect on what led them to this moment and use it to pave the way moving forward. With the accumulation of their old memories and new experiences, the strings rush into the forefront, blossoming as the chrysalises are broken to reveal the butterflies within, now able to fly off into the world of their own choosing. Here we have one of the pieces from Vinland Saga, showcasing Yamada's ability to write music that isn't quite so on the nose as it was with Tokyo Ghoul. This piece is strongly associated with the character Thor's and the legacy he left behind. Once known as the Troll for his strength and brutality on the battlefield, Thor's gave up his life of fighting to focus on what was truly important to him, his family. Though his son Thorfinn wants to be strong and fight as a Viking, Thor's has no intention of letting Thorfinn experience the horrors of war, and even to his last breath, Breath, dies by the mantra that a true warrior is one who fights without weapons. That's just a basic summary of Thor's as a character, but even with only that brief description, there is quite a bit to unpack, and therefore a lot to be considered, when writing a piece of music that represents the legacy of his words. To start with, the soundtrack itself is filled with heavy reverberant string pieces, used to reflect the wide world in the Age of Exploration, as well as the hollow emptiness that keeps the characters like Thorfinn and Canute motivated. The deep bass drone in this piece can be understood as the the weight of Thor's burden, having spent half his life as a cold-blooded warrior, now trying to teach his son the value of life and peace in a world without fighting. The solo cello is also fitting, as it is technically a bass instrument, able to convey the booming presence that Thor's commands with his great stature, but also versatile enough to take on a virtuosic solo line, representing the longing ideals of those who have yet to see them come to fruition.
As atmospheric as this piece is, it's probably the one I remember most from Vinland Saga, and the one that gives me the most chills when it comes on. Thematically, the premise of Vinland Saga's first season is all about journeying to far-off lands, whether it's in search of a new life or as a means to pillage and plunder. Even when the characters aren't actually on the move, many of their conversations are about fighting to protect or bring glory to their homeland. Going back to Thor's and Thorfinn, the concept of the distant and elusive Vinland is one that keeps a young Thorfinn excited to see the world, often pleading Leif Erikson to take him on his merchant boat. This sense of the wide open world is captured beautifully through the flowing strings playing large stretched chords, but it also captures the distress of those who have lost faith in the places they find themselves in. Thorfinn's reason for leaving his village was to join his father on his journey into battle, but when Thors is killed by Askeladd's men, his reason for living and continuing onwards is solely to seek vengeance against his father's killer. Askeladd does everything to bring glory to his homeland of Wales going so far as to lead the very people he despises most in the world for the sake of his ambitions. The lands they came from and call home are long behind them, and only by seeing their personal missions through to the end can they finally feel that they've reached their destinations. From a musical perspective, these two pieces from Vinland Saga aren't its most exciting or even necessarily the most indicative of what Yamada has to offer from the soundtrack, but they show off the manner in which he captures the overarching gloom that hangs over the premise of the series. A simple E minor key with uncomfortable complicated progressions in The Real Warrior and equivalent harmonies in F minor for Somewhere Else leave us with a raw sense of the weight of both pieces. There isn't a need for fancy ornamentations in either of these because they need only convey the small amounts of hope found in the vastness of Vinland Saga's war-torn world. <laughs> With Tokyo Ghoul and Vinland Saga establishing that Yamada is more than capable of creating heavy, epic atmospheres, it's easy to forget that he also enthralled audiences with his upbeat, jazzy masterpiece of a soundtrack in Great Pretender. As I've mentioned before, I have no background in jazz, so unfortunately I can't speak too much to the actual techniques at play when it comes to either the musicality or composition, but I'm almost certain that if you were to play this track to someone and tell them that the composer was the same person that wrote all the previous pieces of music I showed, they'd either be super shocked or just straight up think you're lying. I know I almost couldn't believe it when I saw Yamada's name pop up in the opening sequence for the show, and it made me all the more amazed at just how versatile he was proving himself to be. Again, a huge shame that 99% of anime fans wouldn't recognize his name if asked. What I can comment on here is the manner in which Yamada has adapted to make sure the music fits every aspect of the series as a whole. As I'm only familiar with his music through these three soundtracks, I can't necessarily say that his style is one I would recognize right away. But personally, I like when a composer surprises me with something completely unexpected because it shows that they care more about making great music than they do about making sure audiences know it's them. <coughs> Kajira <coughs> Sawano. Great Pretender is a show about con men pulling off daring heists against corrupt high rollers that takes the protagonists all over the world. There are no intense battles or overly heavy sequences, and even when things do take a darker or more melancholic turn, the music always serves to reflect the more modern modern, realistic situations the characters find themselves in. There's something suave about jazz that allows it to express things in a more down-to-earth way than orchestral music, and in a show that's all about interpersonal relations and wacky heist situations, a big band setup is going to go so much further than an orchestra or chamber ensemble ever could. Add that to the simple fact that the look of the show lends itself best to a more playful style of music with its bright, almost surrealist colors and style, and you realize just how aware Yamada is of the atmosphere he needs to create. And these are only the shows I've seen that he's worked on. Others like Babylon and Laughing Under the Clouds Gaiden were already on my plan to watch list and now knowing that he contributed to both of those is reason enough to bump them up the priority scale. Despite being someone whose enjoyment of a series is half dictated by its music, I don't usually find myself seeking out series or getting overly hyped based on whether the music was written by a composer I like. That said, Yamada is one of those few people that will get me to turn my head, joining the ranks of greats like Oshima Michiru and Tanaka Kohei as a composer that, even if fans don't recognize, has greatly paved the way for new avenues of music and anime. Yamada may have only dipped his toes into the world of anime music, but what little work he has done has made absolutely gigantic waves, setting him apart from hundreds of other composers with way more years of experience under their belts. Honestly, I'm actually pretty shocked that he's not very well known given how huge Tokyo Ghoul is and how easily accessible shows like Vinland Saga and Great 
Comic Pretender are for non-anime fans. I'm definitely interested to check out some of the other things he's worked on to get a taste of what else he has to offer, and I hope that I've inspired some of you guys to check out his work if you aren't already familiar with it. As always, don't forget to like the video, comment down below, and subscribe to my channel, and if you want to get access to all of my analytical transcriptions and voting rights to my future video topics, make sure to support me over on Patreon. Thanks as always for watching, and I will see you in the next one.